Okay, welcome back to Digitizing the Materiality of the Pre-Modern Book. In today's afternoon session, we will have a hands-on session working with early modern books. And our um, instructor is Dr. Megan Piorko, who is a um, special collections librarian at Villanova University and a scholar of 17th century alchemical textual culture. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for the introduction, Sara. And um, so for this session, we're going to um, talk a little bit about different ways to describe the materiality of text. And then I promise we will get our hands on some books. Um, and you all have these sheets in front of you. When we get to that section, if you want to try it out for yourself in the physical form to see how um, different gatherings are created and different type size of books from one sheet. Um, feel free. Okay. So um, first I wanted to talk briefly about the concept of an ideal copy. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this idea, but it is a pretty um, strict way of conceiving of describing a book. And what the aim of finding an ideal copy is and describing an ideal copy is to get at what the author's intention was when creating this book. And I would like to problematize this idea a little bit because I think that when you're describing materiality, that's not necessarily our goal here. Um, and yeah, because many more hands contributed to book production than just the author, and even the author really just could, in theory, just have handed a manuscript to the printer, and then you know they're not that much more involved in the production process. So I want to look at all of the different people that contribute to book production. Um, and then I wanted to talk about scholarly copies versus clean copies, because this sort of is connected to the idea of an ideal copy. So when bibliography was first conceived as a very Western tradition, um, they were really searching for this ideal copy. And an ideal copy is clean. It doesn't have marginalia. It doesn't have um, any of any anomalies to it. It is the you know, most representative version of this edition. And that does have value. Um, but if you are interested in learning about history, about materiality, about book production, um, scholarly copies are, are rife with information and material that you're not going to find if somebody has literally gone through and cleaned the pages of a book, right? We don't do that anymore, but that used to be the practice. So you'll come across books, they'll have no evidence of production use or reuse. That's really what we're looking for. So scholarly copies are much richer for our purposes. So I want to talk about unique copies. Um, so the producer of text or the many producers of a text changes the physical form or creates a physical form when they produce it. Um, and every time a text it has a new edition, is copied in manuscript form, is made from a manuscript to a print, and oftentimes back again, back and forth many times, the knowledge that is contained inside changes. Whether intentional or not, anyone who's involved in the production process of textual production alters the knowledge in some way. This could be an error, or this could be them adding what they think is something really important that the original author didn't put in the text. Um, or it could be annotating it in a certain way that uh, is different from previous editions or copies of the text. So that's why we need to talk about production of books to be able to talk about how they were used and reused. Um, and so I want you all to consider the word copy because for printed text, hand-pressed text, which is what this session is going to be about, we say that every edition has multiple copies. And so you would say this book is a copy from the first edition or the second edition, which would mean the first print run all printed at the same time, the second print run all printed at the same time. And I think today it connotes they're exactly the same. If it was printed, then every copy from an edition is going to be exactly the same after production. And that is not usually the case. Like more often than not, that is not the case. I would say, I would venture to say that it's actually never the case. Um, and if you think about how, what we mean when we say copying, when we're talking about scribal copying in manuscripts, I would invite you to apply that to printed materials as well. So I think everyone 
innately thinks, okay, so I copied it. It's in a different handwriting. I probably changed something by accident. It's going to be different than whatever I copied it from if you're scribally copying. And the same is true of print. Um, you can think about if you photocopy something, because we're thinking about the concept of copying, right? So you photocopy an image and it prints out and you photocopy it again. Are those two pieces of paper that came out of the machine from the same edition of the, of the printing going to be the same? Every time you photocopy it, there's going to be changes to what it looks like in the materiality. Um, thus, every book has an individual history and that's really what we're trying to get at when we are just describing the materiality of a text. So um, what we're going to find out is what material evidence of production, use, and reuse can tell us about texts and what material aspects of textual objects do we want to communicate digitally and how can we do that. So I would like everyone to be thinking about what you are trying to get across digitally through the materiality of the text and so what your focus is going to be on. Whoa. Okay, um, so I think in order to understand hand press book production, you have to think about the materials that produced the text, not just what the text is made out of, but how was it created and what is the machinery that created it, right? We were just upstairs in the scan lab looking at all these wonderful um, imaging and copying and archival digital, uh, digital machines, and so this is and it, you know what? It looks a lot like the Grotz. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah, so maybe that's where he got the inspiration for the, um, his first model. But um, this is a Gutenberg hand press. And it has all of these different parts to it that an expert would have to know how to use um, in a printing house where they have apprentices and journeymen and editors and all different people handling the text even before it gets you know sold during the process of production. Um, and knowing the history of the production helps us identify and describe texts. So we're talking about the hand press period which is about like 1450 and 1450 to 1500 those are going to be incunables early hand press texts and they look a lot like manuscript. We're going to have some of those out for you all. Um, and then the machine press period in starts around 1800 and a lot changes with that. With the digital printing and machines, the copies are relatively similar that are in one edition. So we're not going to be talking about that. But hand press books, printed texts, and manuscripts from this hand press period have a lot of overlap. They influence one another consistently. Um, when the hand press period began, manuscripts did not go away. And they're still around today if you think about you're all taking notes right now, right? Like that's a manuscript. So um, also want to consider the influence of manuscripts on print and vice versa. So I really like this chart. Um, this is Robert Darnton came up with this. Um, in his article, What is the History of Books? And so he here is reconceptualizing the process of printing books through the lens of social history. Um, and so you'll see in the center, he has economic and social conjunctures. So what is driving the desire to print a text? And the author and publisher are up here. And then you have all these other people that are contributing in a cyclical way to book production. So I just like this image as an example of all the different hands that are involved in the production of a text. Um, so printing is, we are able to print because of movable type during this period. Um, and I just wanted to quickly give an overview of what the printing process is like on a Gutenberg hand press. Um, so ultimately you're pressing a sheet of paper onto inked movable metal type. And that entails arranging metal types of letters and symbols into words in a um, predetermined like grid that you have um, based on a manuscript that you that someone has given you. And setting them into the metal frames, inking the surface, and then pressing a sheet of paper. And if you remember what the Gutenberg press looked like, you sort of pull it. You pull it through because it's very heavy. So um, you would create multiple 
um, pulls from the printing press of the same page for as many copies of the books that you would like. So you're not printing it, you know, consecutively, like here's one book. Okay, let's print it again. You're printing all these different pages and then um, you have to organize them based on the signatures in the printed text, which we'll talk a little bit more about when we have the books in front of us. Um, and that tells the binder what order to put the pages when they fold them and bind them. So um, here's a classification of different typefaces. Um, I uploaded this PowerPoint to the Dropbox, so this is mostly for your reference when we're doing bibliographical description with the books. If you wanted to describe the type, um, here's a lot of different options for you. And then here is an image of what a, a movable type looked like. So here's one letter, it's M, and you'll notice it's backwards. So that's another huge challenge in printing is that you're setting up an entire, like usually multiple pages of multiple leaves that are going to be in the codex in one sheet of paper. And so you have to not only lay it out and have so much forethought about that, but you also, it's all backwards. So it's like a mirror effect. Um, and now I wanna talk about paper gatherings and watermarks, because these carry a lot of evidence of production. They can tell you a lot about a text and they can also um, indicate that there are print anomalies within a text through the materiality. So something you can learn from watermarks is where the paper was made. There's a lot of um, volumes of text for specific regions that have examples of many watermarks that come from that region. So if you are able to have a like light under one page and find the watermark, you can tell maybe where the paper came from. Um, and then, and so if, if some of the watermarks don't match up with the rest of the pages, either the printer ran out of paper and pulled from a new sheet, or sometimes you can find like a section that is printed on different paper through looking at the watermarks and then you know, oh, maybe somebody later like had another edition of this text and spliced that chapter in here. So it can tell you a lot about the history of this one object over time. Um, and the paper always has chain lines, which you can see on the pages in front of you. Um, and that indicates how the gatherings are going to be, um, whether it's one of these many things. So it could be a folio, which is one sheet of paper folded in half to make two leaves. And feel free to mess with the papers in front of you. Um, and so you can see what the chain lines would look like if it was a folio. It could be a quarto, which is folded um, so that there's four leaves. It could be an octavo folded so that there's eight leaves because you're just folding one piece of paper. So it's limited to how many, um, to what type of codex it is. And it could also be a duodecimo. Um, and then it's folded so that it has 12 leaves. And this goes on. I've seen a 16th demo and I just like that word too. Okay, so here's some examples of different watermarks um, and where they come from. So this one is from Amsterdam, a fleur-de-lis. So if you found a watermark like that, you would know that this came from a printing house in Amsterdam. Um, and there's probably many different fleur-de-lis watermarks and they will all look a little bit different because they're in this very like illustrative style always, almost cartoony. Um, and sometimes they're really random things. Like here's grapes, right, from Paris. I've seen like a cow. Um, and so this just is a few examples. Like, here's like a jester, a fool's scap um, of different kinds of watermarks. They're usually sort of fun. And then here are examples of different ways that you can create folios, quartos, octavos, duodecimos, because there's not just one way, right? You can see um, the dotted lines are indication of folding, and then the um, non-dotted lines are where you would cut um, after you folded the paper, because some of the leaves are going to still be um, intact. And so you, that's part of the binding process too, is you would have to cut the leaves to make it a codex that you could flip through. This is a quarto. And then here's an octavo. And here's another option called an inverted octavo. And here's a duodecimo. And if people read the article that was assigned for this section, you would know that I used this 
example to determine how there was a ghost edition of a certain text because the way that it was produced indicated that. And so I think understanding hand press book production can actually tell you so much about a text. Okay, um, so this, I want to, we're going to describe the books after we take a break. And I, I wanted to make it accessible in a short time span because bibliographical description is something that people spend a really long time becoming experts in and learning. You can't really learn it in you know, a couple hour sessions. So I tried to make it so that um, based on these slides, you could sort of get creative with it and describe what you think is important in the text within the parameters of traditional bibliographical description. So we're not going to get into a ton of like really confusing anomalies that you can describe in this way. But here are the basics so that you know in the future if you want to learn more about this, where to start. And based on this, hopefully you can use these books and at least make like a general bibliographical description. So first there's a statement of gatherings. This is probably the most complicated part. Um, and it's given using the signatures that I was talking about that are usually at the bottom of the pages um, to construct a shorthand formula. So it ends up looking sort of like a mathematical formula with letters and numbers. Um, so it's, I started out in these slides, it goes from like simple to a little more complicated. Um, so a formula which goes A through C represents a book of three gatherings signed in sequence A, B, C. The letters J, U, and W were not used, so formula A through Z represents a book of 23 gatherings signed regularly. And signed regularly means that it's consistent throughout, and that's also sort of rare. <laughs> and it, it's, it's like very clear why so many different texts have print anomalies if you think about the hand press and printing production and how complicated it was. So, here is a little bit more about the formulas. There's a superscript figure that indicates the number of leaves in a gathering. So A through Z would be a book of 23 gatherings signed A through Z, where each gathering has four leaves. So that would be a quarto. Um, in a description, a number not in superscript attached to a signature refers to an individual leaf. So if you didn't wanna just refer to the gathering as a whole and you wanted to talk about one leaf in the text, you would write, a4 without the superscript. And that would be the fourth leaf in the A signature. The statement of gatherings is combined with the statement of format. So here's an example. Um, format, so it's a quarto. And that means, you know, this is how it's written in this formula. So it's four for quarto. And then it has a um, this symbol here right next to it. And then space, colon, space, A through Z with a small four. Um, which is a quarto book with 23 gatherings regularly signed, each gathering with four leaves. So all symbols used to sign gatherings need to be listed in the formula. Um, this means if the prefatory material, which typically has signatures that are not like these regular uppercase letters, it'll have like an asterisk or a lowercase a or something like that, that needs to be included as well. So this indicates prefatory material that is signed with an asterisk and then A through Z. Represents a gathering of four leaves, I just said that, four, with 23 gatherings signed regularly. It's gonna get a little more complicated. Um, and like I said, I uploaded this to the Dropbox so it's more for you to be able to refer back to. Um, so the superscript figures only refer to the signature which they describe. So they have to be restated every time the gatherings change. So when you find some anomalies, when they're not signed regularly, you're gonna have to insert commas and indicate that every time it changes. So here's just like a, this isn't even close to like the most complicated that it gets, but it's a little complicated for us, um, for our purposes. 11 gatherings. The first of which is signed with an asterisk and has two leaves. The next two are signed A and B and each have four leaves, followed by C, which has six leaves, D and E with eight leaves, F that has two, and then G, H, and I have four leaves each, and finally J has two leaves. So that's probably like the back couple pages that were maybe all printed on a sheet and then cut um, before they were given to the binder, just because of the number of pages in the book. 
The statement of signing and numbering is especially variable, and this means that it's gonna be rich with material information for us to describe and then digitize. So another aspect of creating these bibliographical descriptions today is that tomorrow during SARS session when we do TEI modeling, you can use this in your um, TEI modeling so that you're sort of using your own work um, if you prefer. So you're, after, after you do the bibliographical formula here, which we're all hopefully a little familiar with now, then you say how many leaves there are. So it's like how many pages, um, not page numbers, and, and then say whether they're numbered or not. And this depends on whether it's an early hand press book, probably won't be numbered, or if it's a little bit later, they start using page numbers in a similar way that we do today with machine press. And then here's the signature statement. So this indicates that A through D, the first three, the first three, um, recto leaves are signed. So after that, they're, they're not signed. It's just assumed that it's part of A until B starts. So that's gonna be part of the challenge in counting the gatherings is some of the pages aren't gonna have signatures and are gonna be assumed signatures. Um, and then the first four are signed E through K. And then you can say how they're signed. So Roman caps, with Arabic numerals next to them. So you would have like, if the first three are signed, it would say A1, A2, A3, and then inferred. Um, another aspect of bibliographical description, maybe a little less technical and more room for creativity to highlight what you wanna highlight about the book, because I have been thinking about our conversation yesterday about cultures that we're mapping this categorization onto that don't, necessarily use this type of description. So how can we include that in this for basic formula? So I definitely invite you to get creative with it and describe the parts of the materiality that you think are most important. Um, so within the description, there's a notes section and you can just add notes about what is interesting about the materiality of the text, provenance information, um, which you can find in the ex libri libris or book plates in the front of the book. Um, shelf marks are normally indicated here. So if it was privately owned, you can say that they included shelf marks to show where it was in their private library. Um, and usually the library catalog entry for the text is a great place to start. And then you say you find a name, say Benjamin Franklin signed um, the front of a book and you're like, oh, did this belong to Benjamin Franklin? Then you can do some research if you want to, if you wanna learn more about it in different databases and try to figure out the long life of a textual object. Okay, so here is a simplified version of a bibliographical description for us to use when we are using the books. Um, you're gonna start with a title page transcript. And that is description of the compartment frame or rules. You give the measurement and height and width, and obviously you transcribe what's on the title page as closely to the title page as you can or want to for your purposes. Um, and each break in a word is separated by a line. And I can show you that when we get into describing. Um, and then you're gonna have a letterpress transcription. That's the letterpress transcription, sorry. The title page transcript is describing what the title page looks like. So if you have a um, really incredible border, you could describe that. If you have an image and you can find it in Unicode, you can put that into your bibliographical description if you have a, a weird symbol like a leaf or something. Um, the collation and colophon is, is what we were just talking about, the really complicated statement of format, statement of gatherings, statement of signings, and then foliation or pagination. Um, then you can include what is in the contents of the book, and this helps future researchers or other people know what the book is about beyond the title page. Um, so you can include catch words and running titles, um, what type the page uses, and then you would indicate what the binding looks like as to, to whatever extent you can. Um, it's pretty specialized like skill to be able to tell like 18th century Moroccan leather. Um, and then you have the notes section, which is where you can talk about uh, 
marginalia in the text or anything like that. Oh, and then I was going to show, these are the texts I wanted, before we take a break and put the books out, I wanted to show you what text we're going to put out because um, I think there's eight and there's more than eight of us, so some of you are going to have to work together on a book. Um, and I wanted to show you what we're what we'll be working with so you can start thinking about which book maybe you want to work with. So I put these in order of publication date. Here's an incunable. Um, and it's called Ortis Senatatis, and it is a herbal. So it has all these really great illustrations you could talk about in the notes section that are hand painted. It has some um, marginalia that is, I think, it has a year date, and so it's um, maybe you could find provenance information from here. But this also looks like um, a like somebody added a phrase at the bottom that was important to them. Um, so that this is one option. And so I also I put the um, I put the call number at the top if you want to look in the University of Graz library catalog and get some information from there. I would actually highly recommend that. <laughs> um, and so this is the Infinite Secrets of Nature, 1515. So it's again really early and you can see it sort of, it, print hasn't found its, its um, like consistent way of, that it's going to look visually. It still is trying to find that. It looks a lot like manuscript and it doesn't look like later printed text that might look more familiar to you. And it has some really fun um, marginalia too and images in the text. So this is Emperor Maximilian's third donk um, from 1517. It has really nice engravings and it's written in this um, Gothic German script. So if that's your thing, that might be a good book. It's not my thing. Um, Salustio, 1518. And this has this is a great book if you're interested in the relationship between manuscript and print because it has a lot of evidence of people using print to scribe significant amounts of text. And then it really pushes the boundaries between a strict dichotomy of like, it's either a manuscript or it's a printed text. What, if, you're, if you're looking for this information, then for you, this, you're looking for scribal information. Um, so that's, I think, what's pretty interesting about this text. OK, Galileo's Sidereal Messenger, 1610. Um, this went through many different editions, and so this would be an interesting bibliographical descrip description to do to compare copies from the same edition um, to see if there's any print anomalies. And so I'm sure this is a text you could also find online, and that's a great way to compare two copies if you don't have two in front of you. And it also has a ton of um, provenance information and marginalia on the front title page and then it has these engravings that are didactic to tell you like how he discovered the star with the telescope um, and this is um, I don't know if people know but some recently a lot of the Galileo texts were found out to be forgeries um, so this is really interesting if you are interested in sophistication and techniques to um, replicate a hand-pressed text today, um, we could look into what the forged versions look like and how somebody might go about creating this without a hand press. Um, Bacon's Opera Omnia, 1664. This, you're getting a little more into like a traditional title page that we're used to seeing in a hand press text. It has two columns in the text of the book. Um, and has some provenance information as well. Um, these are, this is a Samo bond, which has three medical and chemical treatises from um, all from the late 1690s. And so these are, maybe I'll let you investigate why you think this, these are bound together, why they might be in Samo bond form. Um, all three is these texts together and whether you could maybe find any other copies that have these three texts bound together or if this is unique in that. If somebody later like chopped up these three copies and then had them bound together for personal, um, a personal copy. 
and then the Sancti Augustini Episcopi, um, 1733. And so obviously it has this incredible fold-out engraving um, that you could talk about in the notes section. And this is a little bit later. So if you're more familiar and comfortable with later hand press technology, um, maybe this is a good book for you. It also has evidence of, um, evidence of the production process in printing, right? Because you can see here with the lines around this engraved image that it wasn't set um, with the type, along with the type. It was printed either before or after on the page. And so that's a whole nother step. Imagine pulling, setting the type, pulling a page, and then having to go back and do it again to put the engraving in. And sometimes you can find in text like this that it's missing. So you'll look at one copy and it'll have it, another copy won't, and it'll have this like, awkward blank space and you're like oh I bet there was supposed to be an engraving put there and nobody did it. Okay so that's what we'll be looking at after a break so if people want to go have some coffee and then when you come back there'll be books out and um, you can use your laptops and pull up the PowerPoint to um, and I can put the I can keep this slide up here too of the mock bibliographical description.